Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of From Our po From Pockets to Portfolios, an initiative by FPSB India to help individuals and professionals enhance their financial knowledge and skills. I'm Sanya Chavan Wilko, Manager Certifications and Engagements at FPSB India, and it's always a pleasure connecting with you all. So today we are honored to have with us uh, a distinguished leader in the financial services industry, Mr. Kalyan Basu. Uh, he's the MD and CEO of Vayana IFSE Private Limited, overseeing the Vayana Trade Exchange, BTX, an ITS platform that facilitates cross-border trade financing established under IFSE guidelines at Gift City, Gujarat. With over three decades of experience in banking and financial sector, Mr. Basu has held key leadership roles at ICICI Bank and Access Bank and was the founding MD and CEO of ATREDS Limited, a leading uh, Mr. Basu, if I am uh, pronouncing this correctly, Treads, is, is it that? Tread yeah, exchange yeah. In India? A, a Treads uh, Private Limited and the uh, name of the platform is Invoice Smart. Okay. Uh, and yes, his expertise is revolutionizing, uh, in, in revolutionizing trade finance and digital platforms, particularly through this BTX, is helping bridge the gap in MSME, MSME financing globally. Uh, with VTX, he aims to bridge the gap between the working capital requirements of MSMEs, not only in India, but across the globe, embarking on a journey to build the best-in-class digital marketplaces for the financing of trade finance, receivables, and payables for cross-border trade. In this session, Mr. Basu will delve into topics such as the impact of digital platforms on global trade finance, the growing significance of gift IFSC, and how innovative technologies like the Vayana Trade Exchange, VTX, are transforming trade financing for MSMEs worldwide. And we are equally privileged to have Mr. Arun sir with us, Arun Tukral, Chair of the CPAC at FPSB India and Professor of Practice at KJ Somaya Institute of Mumbai as our interviewer. And Mr. Tukral is the seasoned BFSI professional with over 30 years of experience across retail banking, corporate banking, treasury, wealth management, and stockbroking. He led Access Securities for over 10 years and achieving significant milestones and is also an acclaimed author of Yogi on the Dalal Street. We are, we'll also have a dedicated 10 minutes question and answer session towards the end of this webinar and where you can ask Mr. Basu any questions uh, related to this discussion. So feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A tab uh, during the session and we will try to address as many as uh, we can with the time we have in hand. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome our esteemed guest, uh, Mr. Kalyan Basu. Uh, thank you, sir, for having, uh, yeah, we have, it's a pleasure having you here, of course. So no, it's I don't my know honor. It's you. my honor. Thank you, Sanya. But Sanya, it's my honor to be here. And uh, thanks to my friend, Arun Tukral, who here has been a friend over more than almost two decades now. In Access Bank, we have worked together and it, it, was a, it was a pleasure when he invited me. It was an honor also for me to be here. Thank you so much for inviting you're most welcome, thank sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sanya. And uh, thank you, Kalyan, for the kind words. And I should thank you for your time. Because you no, are, you not are at all. My pleasure. <laughs> great, great, great. So, so as you know, this uh, particular series is about the personal money management journeys of CEOs, as well as a little bit about their business. And the audience primarily is certified financial planners who have their own set of clients. And they have all kind of client. Uh, uh, they do financial planning, they do wealth management, and maybe some HNI clients also. And every every time we we get a guest, uh, where obviously they know about the journey, personal money management journey, as well as something new to learn. And I think in your case, as Sanya told, we will touch upon those topics. But I think first thing first. Uh, so as we start, that uh, I want you to start with your early career when you started earning and that time your relationship with money and when you started saving at that time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether CEOs save or not. It's no, it, it may not be the be the case for all CEOs. <laughs> to start with, yes, uh, you know, I belong to a very uh, normal, you know, middle class uh, family uh, from Calcutta. So my first job was with Central Bank of India as a, uh, you know, uh, in the Asansol Durgapur region of Central Bank. So as usual, out of Calcutta, where I was born and brought up. And I spent around eight years in Central Bank uh, in that region. 
uh, mostly uh, it uh, revolved around retail banking of course dds uh, then your savings account current account cash clearing so i had learned you can say the nuances of retail banking in central bank of india being worked in almost all departments in small and bigger branches so you have to work in those you know in branches everywhere starting from cash book to salary to pension to you know giving cash remitting cash <laughs> so all such things and then when icici bank first came up with opening their branches in calcutta so i applied i wanted desperately to come back from from the asansol dugapur region to back in calcutta and central bank it was almost impossible so i applied and i got a chance to come back to calcutta so i joined icici bank in 1995 15 days prior to the branch opening 6r mukha 20r mukherjee road was the first branch of icici bank in india the sixth uh, of icici bank so a lot of time was spent there six years spent there in various departments in various capacities uh, heading operations uh, retail as well as corporate operations then i was head of foreign exchange there then when centralization happened i was moved to bombay as the central uh, team then i was moved to product in icici bank a very small niche you know kind of team of only four people directly under the supervision of madhavi puri butch so i had the privilege of working with her for almost two years and uh, as you can understand uh, the timing was from 6 o'clock in the morning to 1 o'clock in the night so it was humanly not possible <laughs> two years <laughs> so i moved on i thought it is time that i either leave or i move on so uh, i applied to access and then i was first selected in access for heading a branch in calcutta so i was thinking of coming back to calcutta again that dream didn't come true so our treasury head who who is one of my very good mentors you can say and of course i look towards him mr p mukherjee i was interviewed by him and i was uh, told that you know what are you going to do in calcutta go to delhi so i went to delhi heading the foreign exchange then in delhi i had you know almost 10 years in delhi i spent 10 12 years as uh, in various capacities again head of north sme head of trade finance head of cbo head of uh, uh, large corporate uh, relationship uh, uh, maintaining relationship with the large corporates as the senior relationship manager for steel cement almost all the major sectors of the uh, you know manufacturing segment then i was uh, moved to bombay by access as head of channel the supply chain finance pan india so while heading supply chain finance trades came in so i was given the opportunity to head trades uh, much before it actually came into life so i was involved with the application to rbi representing axis bank with rbi getting the license building the platform and then making it live and then of course i moved to vayana uh, building up this new platform called vayana trade exchange which is into cross border trade which i will definitely discuss once we get into the details so that's a brief of my journey yeah so uh, humble background i think that is what uh, we have seen almost all the ceos we have interviewed i think they all started with a very very humble background and and the story is very inspiring uh, and the way you explained it uh, bit by bit uh, so one more uh, thing which i which i touched upon was that when in the early career you remember that you started saving some some money and and maybe over a period of time you must be must be facing some kind of challenges also that uh, yeah money money saving is also important and maybe then you have some serious efforts that okay i should save this much spend this much so can you can you recall any such uh, time in your life at that point of time like how you started your money money saving journey or money management journey Or so money management journey to be true but to be very very true to you know what has happened in my life at least see i started saving only after the age of 40 so when i went to central bank of india i was alone there and you know the kind of salary that you you used to we used to get so making a living itself was a challenge and then of course i built a house small house taking a loan from central bank of india so making two ends meet was uh, something which was very very paramount rather than saving so uh, that was the, that was the case till the age of 40 you can say 
and then uh, you know I, I i during this period of uh, till i reached 40 i opened various recurring deposit accounts but never not a single recurring deposit could run to the maturity so there was something which will come up and I, you, you need the money and you break it <laughs> so that was that was the first part of the journey uh, the second part started yes so i had priorities so i have two daughters so i had to uh, their education our uh, family commitments building a house all those things were there and you can say at this fag end i am now i can say i am debt free so 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 the investment uh, if you see started from only 40 40 years of age great answer uh, because normally nowadays see at our time uh, because i also started my career during that time the the main uh, a thing in our life was roti kapra and makan Yes. Maybe we have to make two ends meet, but nowadays maybe our kids are privileged that they, <laughs> they start with a definitely a much better background and all of us started saving quite late. Although nowadays they say that start early, which is a fact that you have to start early. But the, the they also say that if you have not done that, the be next best day is today. So whenever you can, you should start saving. But yeah, preferably nowadays people would start early and nowadays the kids are more conscious about money and about anything. They are, they are definitely much more learning and we never had an internet and to know about a lot of things happening in the financial world also. So as you said that uh, uh, with with the, the family expanding, you had two daughters and maybe uh, uh, you thought of buying some insurance at that point of time. Yeah, yeah. Work? So okay. as soon as I, as I built my house, my priority was that whatever loan I take should be covered by an insurance, at least life insurance to be, to be precise. So I always used to cover whatever amount I had as a loan, it should be covered by my insurance. So that is one investment you can say, I don't know whether it's an investment or an expense, but at the end of the day, that is something that I, uh, that I continued. Okay. Uh, and anything about the real estate, uh, you bought a house at that point of time or later in life? So I actually, when you uh, you know, in Central Bank of India, uh, when I was there, I built a house in Durgapur because I I did not I did not ever for foresee that I will be moving out because Central Bank uh, at that point of time was in such a shape that getting to Calcutta was extremely difficult. So I thought it's better to buy you know build a house in in and around that area. So that was the only thing that I did. But then this ICICI Bank opportunity came. And I moved on to Calcutta, so I sold off, sold it off. So I bought, bought another house in Calcutta after a few years. So that's how it is. It is more uh, more out of compulsion rather than an investment. Okay. Uh, so that was actually my question. So if I if I ask you now your asset allocation, uh, so so people in India, I think uh, uh, most of our uh, ancestors, uh, uh, so so they used to love gold and uh, real estate. And over a period of time, we have seen the financialization. So maybe uh, are you now invested sufficiently in equity and debt and commodities and real estate and gold? Is there a is there a some kind of a classification, a rough classification that you are more into equity or more into debt? Uh, what kind of asset allocation you do now? See, if you see uh, asset allocation, Arun, I think most of it goes to real estate because obviously you have to have a house. And I don't see it as an investment. You can have a notional, you know, feel good factor that my house now is valued this much. But then if you're staying in that house, that's a notional happiness that you may have. But then, uh, of course, uh, if you, allocation wise, if you talk about 50% is almost home and the rest of it is equally divided between equity and FD. I am an old timer, so I still believe in keeping some cash. <laughs> so okay. yes and, and and you are an expert in foreign exchange you are heading foreign exchange and you have worked <laughs> in a large bank like access so so you never thought of uh, getting into dabbling into currency futures and taking a bet on commodities and uh, uh, currency and all that see so, so uh, kind of a thought, think, yeah uh, yeah see maybe the alignment of Taking a, a plunge in that area had never occurred to me because uh, <laughs> that area, you know, though you can say I am an expert, I am, I know trade, I know I have been in this department for a long time. But can you really predict market? Can you really predict the events that are that are going to come? So I am not keen to get into an area which I am not able to foresee 
the future. And there can be drastic volatilities which can actually erode whatever I have. So uh, it's quite hard earned. So uh, I, I don't get into uh, you know that kind of uh, markets where I have absolutely no control. Uh, I miss, uh, there are thousands of people predicting so they have they have their own logic. I also have my own logic, but those those logics don't hold good <laughs> most of the time. Okay, okay. And, and and how do you manage risk in your portfolio? Although I can see there's not a much risky portfolio anyway. You follow, and I'm sure. Uh, but still, I would ask you whether you have ever thought of putting money in uh, in cryptocurrencies in Bitcoin today and whatever the uh, new age investors do. So what is the definition of risk and whether you have tried this exotic uh, asset class at any point of time of thought of? Yeah. So I will come to crypto later, but I will uh -huh. take how do I cover risk? So my my formula is very simple. See, the market FD gives you a return of 7.5% at the most now. If mm -hmm. I get, if I invest in an equity, if I am getting 20, net of tax 15, I am very happy. I sell it, finish it off. I don't look back. That that has gone given 80%, 90% and cry. So I'm very happy getting 20. And I invest in something different whenever the, I think the time is suitable. Otherwise, I put it in FD and keep quiet for some time. So my risk appetite is limited to the sense that I have limited expectations. And when those expectations are met, I'm out of it. As far as crypto is concerned, uh, see, boom. Crypto is like, you know, having your own bank. See, the bank is actually your laptop. Uh, it, well, what kind of significance it has, what kind of uh, credibility it has, what kind of legal framework it has, it is absolutely complete ambiguity. So I generally would not go into ambiguities. Yeah, I think great answer. Uh, I think I, I get uh, mostly similar answer uh, from <laughs> the last four or five episodes. Maybe yes. uh, I think sometimes it's a generation gap or maybe yes, we are yes. very, very traditional and our kids, they sometimes they don't agree with us, but uh, that's that's life. And maybe over a period of time, uh, so so we always say that it should have a base. And I, I keep asking youngster that why are you so much keen? But youngster and youngster nowadays, so they, they are loving Coldplay and uh, panicking that they are not getting tickets. Uh, we are not even bothered. <laughs> so... so, <laughs> so so maybe yes, yeah, yeah, there is there will, is some yeah, that will stay that that kind of uh, that will, that will of always... course happen. See the, how our yeah. fathers used to think, how our grandfather used to think. We have not th thought that. See, I have been. See, my my father is a banker, so he has all he has spent around thirty five years of his life in Punjab National Bank. So when he heard that I am leaving Central Bank of India and coming to ICICI, he simply was you know completely taken aback. How can you, how can somebody take such a decision? So yeah. there will be generation gaps. So uh, yes. I am not saying that crypto is bad or good or ugly, but then of course it is, it may be, may not be my cup of tea. And, and how comfortable you are uh, with the technology apps? Like nowadays there are so many apps that you can invest through these apps, whether it's mutual fund, whether it is stock, whether it is anything else, any asset class. Nowadays just on the press of a button. So are you comfortable or you have your own uh, advisor? You you do some kind of a consulting? How you do that? You no, no, the execution. To, to, <laughs> see, I don't have an advisor. Um, um, and uh, of course, uh, I do it through the apps. It is very, right. very cumbersome otherwise. So yeah. I have, uh, you know, to uh, one demand account with access, of course. Yeah. So I use that only. The, the access app is very good. Uh, and, and thanks to all of you for making such a wonderful lab for investment at Access Direct. So I only use that uh, for investment and, of course, internet banking for any other needs. So I hardly go to the branch and uh, there's no need as such. Uh, but but uh, the audience today here is the financial advisor and financial planner. So maybe you and I can understand a little bit about markets and we can do that. But yeah. what do you think the role of a financial planner or an advisor how, how the role should be and what kind of expectation an investor would have? Uh, as a layman, what, what comes to your mind? See, as an advisor, I think, uh, you see, anybody yeah. who is advising, I think, first of all, if somebody is seriously seeking advice, you should give advice. That is my first criteria. Otherwise, there is no use of giving advice. 
so if somebody is seriously thinking take you know want to have your advice as a financial planner provide them the best possible thing that you think is good for him or her so i uh, beyond that nothing can happen see advice is an advice you know he is not, he may be an expert he may not be an expert his is uh, whatever he tells whatever the fortune whatever you know pro- futures that he has committed may come true may not come true for so many reasons but while advising i think he should be true and honest to himself and provide the best possible advice he can honestly to the person who actually seriously takes it great uh, yeah. another thing when you invest company's money so so you run a large company so so that kind of a differentiation investing your own money and investing or risk taking capacity at your personal level and at company's level is different or similar or or how does it no no in company's on? case in company's case it is more stringent see at, at least i am not dealing with my money so i have okay. to be much much more cautious and much much more risk averse but there is no choice so in invoice smart if you say that you know there is a risk framework available where you can invest where you cannot invest there is hardly any option available and in vana as well we don't have you know invest anything which is there in excess other than fixed deposits we don't get into equity we don't get into any other kind of uh, investments as such but of course you know these are small uh, vana is a small company so was axis age age of trades but if you're talking about large companies there are i think people capable people who take decisions to invest in equity invest in various other uh, you know uh, instruments after deliberation taking this uh, decisions come uh, you know uh, uh, together whether to invest how much to invest till what time you remain invested i think it's a, it's a, for all companies it's a very very conscious call to be taken so so as you said that uh, see see you were part of a trade as a startup you said you you founded it and you were part of that founding team and yeah. and that was uh, with with help of access bank of course and now obviously it's a much smaller company which will become big because because you are there and the leadership obviously chose you to head that so over a period of time so now getting into your your domain what do you how do you see the future of trade finance and and for the audience sake you can briefly explain that what exactly you do and what is trade finance and what are the different areas you you touch upon little bit about your business yeah so arun if you if you talk about any gdp whether it is global gdp indian gdp state gdp what is the gdp it is the accumulation of trade correct so anything that is trade needs financing and anything that needs financing i think not each one of the players in trade gets an easy access to finance so what trades uh, the platform in voice smart that we had built in access and what vana trade exchange actually brings on the table is easy way of getting finance it is no i should not say easy i should say a seamless way of getting finance digitally it makes your life simpler as far as the you know the process is concerned as far as documentation is concerned as far as cost is concerned as far as security is concerned both you know uh, um, uh, cyber security and other forms of security i think when you do something digital you leave a footprint which is very very important in any trade so whether it is uh, you know the trades platforms doing their business or it is you know, in uh, vana trade exchange doing the itfs platform business for cross border trade when you leave a footprint you are careful you are careful about onboarding whom who the seller is who the buyer is who the financier is where the money is coming from where the money is going there is a digital trail which remains and that is very important and that's why trade if you see as it moves to digitalization further in the days to come i think things will be much much better than what we have seen in physical documents so there are innumerable frauds innumerable you know mishaps which happened for each and every financial institution Uh, in the past there are thousands of examples of that i am not saying that digitization would uh, completely eradicate all these issues but yes to a great extent if it is actually implemented in a in a better way it is much better system than your physical documents and it is seamless we are actually you can see the borders of uh, various countries are now not other than the physical borders the the trade borders are vanishing 
though the scenario today may be slightly different with so many wars going on, Correct. but near yeah. shoring, friend shoring, and all these wars coming up. But at the end of the day, it's the amalgamated world. There is no other way but going the digital way if you really have to do a seamless trade. And I think we are moving towards that. Great, great. I think you have explained in a very simple term. Uh, little bit on the gift city. I think gift city is a boon to India. So, so can you explain the opportunities at gift city and, and cross-border financial services, how it helps? See, gift city, of course, you know, it is very, very amazing that India did not have a financial center like the DIFC in Dubai or Singapore or London or See, these economies are much, much less than us. Not today, but previously also. So India should have had a financial center or a financial hub like those much earlier. But having said that, it is good that we are now starting off and Gift City is actually taking off in a big way. So we have two, you know, for global exchanges there, one bullion exchange there. We have these ITFS platforms. We have now 29 banks, uh, shut up uh, shops there. We are talking about aircraft leasing. We are talking about ship leasing. So there are, there are innumerable things happening. And the best part is the, the regulator is always very, very agile, open. You can always go and meet them. You can always talk about your issues. They're eager to solve them. They're eager to meet you. They're eager to understand you and provide you the infra or the facilities that you need. I think Gift City will come up very, very well. And it has the backing of almost a four trillion economy. So I think it's a great initiative of government of India and it, it should only thrive in the days to come. Thanks. Thanks again, explaining in such a simple words. And also you have been an MSME expert. You have worked all your life in different <laughs> capacities at Access Bank and, and this role also. So as a, as a sector, MSI, how it is shaping up? What are their challenges and opportunities? And how are you helping them? A little bit on SME, MSME sectors. So I have, uh, you know, uh, dealt with MSMEs uh, in the uh, previously also, you know, where once you are in trade finance, it is mostly, you know, the large corporates are definitely there. There are many MSMEs who are exporting. And as you know, that this number is not uh, unknown to anyone. 45% of our exports are from MSMEs. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great initiative, like great initiatives, innovative initiatives like ITFS uh, platforms like BTX would help. Because see, what you are bringing on table is, you know, liquidity. Liquidity not only from Indian financials, liquidity from finance across the globe. And today, the financing of MSMEs in India or the exporters in India are mostly driven by banks only. Now, going ahead, if you have a platform where an MSME exporter can be financed to a Singapore financial or a financial sitting in Germany, which is happening as such today. Most of our trades that we have done till now in BTX over, over you know, around, we have just started. So it, it, the number may not be very big, but we have already financed around $15 million of uh, trade. And most of it is done by a financial in US, Singapore. There are a couple of financials in Singapore. There is a one financial in, you know, uh, you uh, Germany, there are other financiers coming up. So you bring liquidity not only from Indian financiers, but also globally. That helps. And since the journey is completely digital, uh, it also makes the makes the exporter comfortable to upload documents, whether he is Coimbatore or in Kanyakumari or in Kashmir or in wherever. It doesn't matter. Geographical location actually doesn't make any difference. All you need to do is upload those documents. We verify. We give it to the financiers for their, you know, rate quoting of rates. They bid for it. The the seller accepts it, and the financier sends the, uh, you know, uh, the remittance directly to the seller's bank account in India. So that is simply, you know, a very very high uh, brief profile of what we do. So if we bring in, you know, financiers from all across the globe, it definitely helps the MSMEs. Uh, of the country and the product that we deal in is factory now factoring as a product as you know in india uh, has not actually made any progress as far as cross border trade is concerned and even in the domestic side it was only after trades that factoring actually became popular and actually was implemented and today we have humongous volumes see each platform doing a billion dollar a month so three platforms are there doing six billion dollars a month worth of disbursements and it is for all msmes 
you see the kind of portfolio being created for the financiers. There are about 60 financiers in on those trades platforms. So see the book that is being built up, how granular, self-liquidating. You know, the average size usance period for these bills are around 60 to 75 days. So it is self-liquidating. And, and it is completely detail journey, except for a few parts of onboarding, which still, uh, because of the KYC AML reasons, is more or less physical. Other than that, it's a completely seamless journey with complete legal framework around it. So I think, I think you know, it, it's a huge progress that we have made as far as MSME financing is concerned. And of course, the banks are there to help. But then how much they can help physically, because I have been in MSME department for a long time. The moment you seek collateral and the moment you seek property as a collateral, it is definitely not a process which can be brought below one and a half months. Somebody has to visit the property, somebody has to value the property, somebody has to check the valuation. It takes humongous time. You, you just cannot bring it down. And these are done for work capital. Again, again, you know, the asset that is hypothecated is receivable. So it is much better to do a receivable financing through platforms like Feds rather than getting into that kind of a scenario where you have to give your personal guarantee, you have to give your house, you have to give your LIC policy, what and what not, whatever you have. How long can an SME continue giving such kind of collaterals and growth? There is a limit. I think great, great uh, platform from for for SMEs and and the financier also. They are also getting a good return on. And now you are saying what you were doing at Atred that was mostly domestic and this is cross border. Yes. And there are more and more uh, investors from different countries. And yes. I, and I'm sure you would be covering uh, their satisfaction or risk and all. And you would be comforting them on you have built in systems where they don't have to worry about the money. I think that yes, is yes, see, the factoring as a product. Uh, see, these yeah. people understand the global financiers understand the product factoring and how to cover the buyer risk. Correct. So Correct. they have Correct. their own mechanism, either through credit insurance or they have a risk, uh, you know, uh, mitigation solution around the buyer or whichever way they choose to. They have a risk mitigant for a de for a default scenario if in case the buyer defaults. So those things are in place and those uh, you know processes are being digitized on the platform so that they have the all the uh, participants have a seamless journey it's a it's a complex thing maybe the first timer would find it slightly difficult but it's very interesting once once you were speaking i think people would read a little bit more about this and maybe they go to your website and because these uh the audience today is the financial planner and sometimes they also sometimes many a times they have some sme clients also so now I think this would help them to understand them better. So there are there are exporters, yes, yes. there are some other guys, their bank account, their investment uh, philosophy, and they would understand them better. So I think any Absolutely. any advice for and any advice for those planners who are dealing with these SMEs. Yes, so, yes. So, if you have yeah. any exporter, I think for any small exporter, small medium enterprises who, <laughs> who are seeking finance, I think. Viana Trade Exchange or the ITFS platforms that we have today working from Grift City is the best possible solution that you can have. The easiest solution that you can have. You hardly, your cost is hardly anything. You need not, it is completely without recourse and unsecured, first of all. The process is factory. Digitally, okay. you upload documents, you get into only one agreement. The fees are very, very nominal for us. And... Uh, Otherwise, whatever the discounting charges are, you can always get a good rate on the platform. So as you can see on trades, maybe we will come to that uh, that stage maybe around a year, maybe in future. But if you see trades, people are getting absolutely phenomenal rates uh, on this platform because, because of competitive bidding. So uh, I think it, it's a great platform for financial planners to tell their customers if they have MSME exporters uh, with them to come onto the platform, at least seek an appointment and see how take a platform demo and understand the process. I think I think now they have an idea and they will they will look at your website and maybe connect and and obviously I can also get those details and pass it on to you from FPSB. So, sure. so thank you, th thank you, thank you, uh, Kalyan. Maybe we'll take some questions, uh, Sanya. If there are questions, we can we can take now. Hello, sir. 
that yeah. was quite an engaging session it was a lot for me to learn as well thank you <laughs> i i come from the cold play uh, generation okay so, <laughs> i know what that jo- joke is about so yeah. i can definitely connect with that and i am sure yes. the audience could as well so uh, arun sir i'm sending you a question uh, that we have received from the audience uh, if you could paraphrase it correctly uh, i'll send it to you on chat let's see the first one accredited investors or investor were yes. classified uh, okay were classified as understand the market risk i would like to know whether these investors get credited can be investment so it is basically uh, the gift city investment kalyan if yeah. this or lrs and all so can you can you little bit talk about that see lrs is something that that is something which the which is of course falling into the bank's domain i think there are about 29 banks in the gift city who can who can better explain those uh, intricacies so if you would uh-huh. wish uh, we can definitely connect it connect with you with some of the banks where you can pay, uh, you can explain to them uh, personally i can give share the telephone numbers and then you can get the details because these are bank products and i i should not be you know uh, uh, getting uh-huh. into <laughs> their domain as such uh and, it is and you said there are 29 speak. banks also set up but yeah yes. you can help them if they if they reach out to yeah, you yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah because i i have seen the gift city regulation gift city requirement a little bit complex for a layman so i think this kind of queries will keep coming and no, i I, think will, are, I will tell yeah. you there are many things which are coming up in gift for the indian residents uh, i i may not be an expert on that so i will restrain myself but then yeah. you get in touch with the banks i think there are many many things which are which are which are there which are coming up i actually was in gift city uh, a few days back and there uh, the regulators were there so they were talking about many many investment schemes which are coming up so uh, i think uh, they, they you should get in touch with the banks there another question i see that retail investor can they participate in the financing of msme via this platform no retail investors are still not permitted so it is only the you know factoring companies and the banks and the nbfcs or the fis you can say the financial uh, you know uh, entities uh, financiers are restricted to th- those communities it is not the retail uh, p- uh, you know people who can finance through vtx so another related question i think in your domain which uh, you can answer this this msme exporter how does an exporter benefit when he gets through uh this kind of funding via the uh, visa vis the local funding in india uh, uh compared to ifc ifsc yes. is there any specific benefit so it's uh, the answer will be slightly long see yeah. if you see in trade there are you know three basic different uh, domains through which financing uh, or the entire trade happens one is of course the lc route which definitely can be can be easily financed through banks one is the collection route where you send the documents through a bank to a to its correspondent bank for collection and one is the open account open account means where you are directly sending your documents to the buyer now this route actually today accounts for 80% of global trade none of indian banks i can say are apps are not very comfortable financing it or they hardly finance open account transactions where you are sending documents directly to the buyer but this trade is happening with all exporters mostly msme exporters because there are large buyers who are neither interested in opening lcs and incurring cost neither is it feasible because doc- document to collection is a very very cumbersome and physical as well as costly issue so open account is something that people are going towards because of the buyer preference and there are hardly any way you can get a open account transaction financed through any of the indian banks and if even in case you get a finance also you have to provide huge collateral and there are cumbersome documentations and our product of factoring is only open account transactions where you are sending good sending documents directly to the buyer so in that case through vtx you can finance all your open account transactions to a credible buyer outside india so that is the advantage and the documentation is seamless it is less costly there is no need for providing any physical documents and we do a thorough due diligence of the transaction for the sake of the financier as well as for the seller 
we do a thorough inter due diligence on the buyer and most of the trade is covered by trade insurance so you are sure that somebody has provided a limit on the buyer for your trade to be financed which should give you a comfort as an exporter that the buyer is a credit worthy customer that also you you, you can assume through the through this trade insurance so i think there are there are multiple reasons why people should come onto the platform uh, for doing open account transactions as there are hardly any possible other options available to them Okay, so I think some other questions also related to the MSME credit. So somebody is asking, can you share some link or some material for the MSME credit based solutions? So, and I will ask my MSME clients to approach. So for this, I think, uh, what what do you suggest? Can we so get you the... can you can you can send us yeah. uh, around the the people who yeah. are interested to you know understand in detail. So we okay, will be great. very very happy to provide them with uh, with the detailed uh, understanding of what we do what is possible on the platform. If it is not possible on the platform, where they can go and seek help and support. So that will be absolutely okay with us. That would be great. I think that would be great. Uh, what my understanding is that uh, the, this set of uh, audience, I think they are trying to uh, understand this uh, specific platform and the process. And I think they would have more queries. And what we would do is we would collect everything. I think Sanya would uh, share with me and we can we can send it to you. And then maybe you can connect uh, with your team or wherever possible. Uh, wherever Absolutely. They can you can some. always visit our website and put in a query. So there is a special place where you can put in a query. Or if you have if you are there in this webinar, please send it to uh, you know uh, Mr. Arun or whomsoever you are connected to. We will be definitely connecting with you and giving you the we know details in Great. this case i would uh, i would like yeah. to intervene and uh, advise yeah. our audience that if uh, if you have any similar queries you can write to us at events at fpsb.in i'll leave this uh, email address on the chat so that you can keep it handy so you can ask the queries and we will i'll compile those queries and share it with you basusa yes yes and you can also share my if, if you think it is okay you can share my yeah. email ID with the participants. They can also directly write to me and we will ensure that we will answer those questions. That would thank be you so much. kind. So nice of you, yeah. Kalyan. So we and are a new platform. You. We need to, we need to, uh, you know, tell people what we do. It's a, it's a great thing for, you know, uh, for everyone to have such a platform and for government of India to come up with this idea. And we would like SMEs to, you know, benefit out of this. I think that's a great service you are doing other than... No, no, not at all. The, the, one is the business. Other is the way you are saying that you take my idea and send it to me. I think that's so nice of so kind of you. No, so, no so I, Sanya, have... I think you can you can spread the word, not only the audience who are attending and you would be, I think, sharing this on the platform and much many more people would also watch this. So yes. I think we would come back to you, Kalya, and, and thank you very much. And over to you, Sanya, now. And we can... Okay, so it was... Absolutely enlightening to be a part of this. And it is every time I'm a part of the series. Uh, so thank you so much, Mr. Basu, for sharing your invaluable insights with us today. It's been truly enlightening session. And we are all taking away a wealth of knowledge on trade finance and the digital platform shaping the future of MSME financing. A special thank you to Mr. Arun sir for expertly guiding today's conversation and for his valuable contributions to this webinar series. And of course, a big thank you to all our participants for joining us today. Your engagement and questions added so much value to the session, and we are very grateful to you. Uh, you. For today's thank webinar, uh, kindly note that all CFP professionals will have uh, the opportunity to earn two CPD credits once the session has been uploaded to your LMS portal within the next two weeks. Uh, the webinar will also be available on, your, on our official YouTube channel by Monday, so please do check it out there. And as we conclude, con uh, conclude uh, please stay tuned for more insightful episodes uh, in our From Pockets to Portfolio series. Uh, so thank you once again and have a wonderful day. And if you have any queries, as I earlier mentioned, you can leave it on events at fpsb.in. And we would be kind enough to share it with uh, Mr. Basu and help you with that. So thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Sonia. Thank, thank you, Arun. Thank, thank you, you so much for inviting. Thanks. And thanks yeah. once again to the entire all participants. Thank you. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kalya. Thank you, Sanya. Bye. Thank yeah. you. Bye.